All right, everybody, we are on the way to the University of California, San Diego, where Steve and I both work as endocrinologists talking about the latest and greatest uh, research. But we figured while we're on our way there, like we mentioned earlier, we wanted to talk about COVID. And why COVID? Well, it's the reason that we're doing this in a van, to be honest. Yeah. Um, there's a lot going on in terms of what's going on with the vaccine, um, you know, who's at risk, all these kinds of things. We're going to focus in on the booster. Yes. Uh, who should get that? Because that's kind of the, the hot topic right now. But I think before we jump into that, the first thing we should say is that if you have type 1 diabetes, you know, hopefully you've already gotten the initial course of your vaccine. Everybody living with type 1 diabetes should be vaccinated. Unfortunately, we're at higher risk of complications. So if you haven't already gotten your first uh, shot or two, please, for God's sakes, do that. Um, but few folks out there that say, well, gosh, I got my first two shots. Now I'm hearing about Delta variant and, you know, should I get the booster, Steve? He, he, Steve just did a bunch of research on this, so we're going to listen to what he has to say on this. Yeah, well, basically, this is this. You're eligible for a booster eight months after your second shot of the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine. The guidance hasn't been put out for the J&J. &J. And anybody that's immunocompromised is really a prime candidate to get the booster. Now, us type ones are immunocompromised. You know, the most obvious people are the ones taking immunosuppressants. If you've had an organ transplant, like a kidney transplant. And also, if you're taking chemotherapy. But I say this, that, you know, us type ones, we can get COVID easier. We have worst outcomes. Why not, why take any chances? And especially if you're over 70 and you have other comorbid conditions. Yeah, you know, we were lucky as healthcare providers to get the shots like very early. So I got mine in December, you know, so we're at that eight month, you know, even nine month mark now. Um, and it makes me nervous that, you know, a, a waning immunity and especially being in healthcare and having type one diabetes. So as soon as they tell me that I can get it, God knows I'm going to be first in line. Yeah, let me, you know, when you get, if you got the Moderna vaccine originally, that's the one you have to get for the booster. You can't switch from Moderna to Pfizer or vice versa. The side effects are basically the same. Everything from no side effects at all to a little fever, muscle aches, um, and that can be taken care of with Tylenol. And it's hard to predict if you're gonna be getting more severe symptoms or not. And even if you didn't get any of the first two, you might get one during the booster and that's not a bad thing. It tells you that you're immunized. Yeah. And it's again worth taking a step back that when this all started, remember how we were talking about, everybody said people with diabetes did worse with COVID, but we just didn't know how type ones fit into that picture. Everybody was talking about diabetes, but what they really meant was type two. Since that time, it's become very clear that us type ones, unfortunately, to be honest, we fare exactly the same as type twos, that we have high risk of complications of being hospitalized, et cetera. Um, and so the risk benefit in terms of getting the vaccine is much in the favor of benefit that, yeah, you know what? When I got my second shot, it wasn't fun. I was achy, I felt like crap for a day, but I was stoked, you know, like, like being protected against COVID is huge. You know, it, it makes you feel free. Yeah. And you know, the thing is, you know, even though the vaccine, both Pfizer and Moderna are pretty good after six months, the reason why the CDC said eight months because they follow the people that get infected, even though they're fully vaccinated. And the rates of COVID in those fully vaccinated start to creep up at seven, eight months. Yeah. And that's why they pick that time period. Well, thank God we've both been vaccinated, Steve, because we don't have six months to, or six feet to, to spare in this thing. I mean, we're like shoulder yeah. to shoulder right here. Yeah. Um, and we can't socially distance in this guy. Well, the other thing is, I just want to remind everyone, now it's flu season. Oh, right. So that they both, the flu vaccine, the COVID vaccines, they affect different viruses. And it's highly recommended that you get a regular flu vaccine. And, and I would suggest waiting at least a week in between, whichever one you get first, to make sure you have no symptoms from either vaccine. Yeah. And the symptoms are exactly the same. Yeah. 30, 30 seconds. So, well, that's basically it on the COVID booster yeah. right now. Yeah. I mean, uh, we're, we're I mean, we want to protect everybody and we're both pretty strong on everyone with type 1 should get the booster. Yeah. All right. Well, we're about to pull up to my work here. So thanks for the little update, Steve. Hey, you're Appreciate welcome. It. All right. Hey, 
everybody, I'm here at the Altman Clinical and Translational Research Institute, ACTRI. The Altman family is a very generous family, has type 1 diabetes in their family, donated money to UCSD to form this amazing building that I work in that has all kinds of research going on in type 1 diabetes. I'm very excited to tell you about what's going on, not only here, but across the, the world, really, in terms of type 1 research. So, come on, follow me. All right, everybody, welcome to our conference room where we actually usually have our weekly lab meetings to talk about all the research that we're doing. And I wanted to take this time to give you an overview of type 1 diabetes research. So when people talk about what research is going on in type 1 diabetes or what's going on in the cure, I mean, there's just so many different buckets to think about, and that's what I wanted to break down for you, that when we talk about the cure or research, it's, it's not just one thing. Lots of different areas of research, so I wanna to try to explain it to you, and who's gonna be talking more specifically about it. So I have some categories up here. So this first one that I drew is a very sophisticated kind of needle and some pills, and it says immunotherapies. So what immunotherapies are is they're medications that basically alter the immune system. And when we talk about type 1 diabetes, what ultimately causes it, it's an autoimmune disease where our, our immune system goes awry, we don't know why, it attacks and kills our own beta cells in the pancreas. So people are working on therapies to stop that immune attack. And the key to this is actually when to use these medications. So there's a lot of research that's been going on now in terms of preventing type 1 diabetes, so actually intervening before somebody comes down with symptoms of high blood sugar actually just recently had a drug go to the FDA and pending approval to be the first drug to kind of help prevent type 1 diabetes. So that's exciting. And also therapies that when someone's newly diagnosed, let's say you just get type 1 diabetes, well guess what? You still have about 20% or so of your beta cells that are left. So it's worth coming in even then with some kind of immunotherapy that if you could stop the, the disease from progressing, you'd be left with 20% of your cells not too shabby. So these might be injections, these might be pills, um, other, you know, therapies that we might use in, in transplant medications or for other diseases that we're looking at in type 1 diabetes. Very active area of research. Um, doesn't really pertain so much to people who've had it for a long time, like myself, um, but I'll get to that where we come in a little bit later. The next category is what I would call beta cell or cellular replacement. So we know again that in type 1 diabetes, our beta cells are kaput. They're, they're simply gone after a period of time. So we need more beta cells. And there's lots of ways to do that. Actually here at UCSD, we were the first um, place in the world to do a stem cell beta cell replacement approach where we actually uh, took stem cells, a company called Viacite, that were able to become beta cells package them in a little uh, device to help protect the cells, and then it actually implanted them subcutaneously in patients' back or in their flanks to try to have these cells start producing insulin, but protect them from the immune system. That study's been going on for six or seven years now, just now getting to the point where we can make these cells actually start producing insulin in response to patients' high blood sugars. So still not there yet, but we have this technology now to actually give patients back the cells. You don't need a whole pancreas. You just need the little thimble full of beta cells um, and you can put those in different locations. So to talk more about these two different areas um, is my buddy, Aaron Kowalski. I'm just gonna put Aaron. Um, who's the, the CEO of JDRF. So, um, you know, what better person to give us information on this um, than Aaron. So he also has type 1 diabetes, the first CEO ever of JDRF to have type 1 diabetes. So I'm gonna throw it to him in a little bit in New York to give you some more information on this stuff. Next is something that's probably a little bit more familiar to you guys. This is artificial pancreas stuff. So what I have here is a pump and this is a dude and he's got a CGM on his arm right there. That's a CGM. So an artificial pancreas is, is basically that. You guys know what it is. It's a, it's a pump and a CGM that talk together to completely you know, automate insulin delivery. And we're getting there with some of these hybrid closed loop systems now, tandem control IQ, uh, people that are looping or using Medtronic, uh, but they're not fully automated. So the idea is take us to a place where I don't have to do anything. Um, if I eat, I get more insulin, and if I don't eat, I, I get less, et cetera. Um, 
This is something that is happening obviously here and now, that we're getting updates with these systems every year. It seems like I'm on one of these systems. Made a huge difference in my, um, my quality of life, I'm sleeping better. I wake up in range every day. My blood sugar is 100, 110 or whatever. Not because I'm smart, I'm a doctor, but I have one of these systems that's helping me get in better control. So for this, I'm gonna throw it in a second to Leslie Island. Uh, who is in Omaha, and she's really an expert in this area and is gonna give us the latest and greatest about what's, what's here now and what's coming in the, in the pipeline. So the final thing is the area of research that I focus most on because I'm selfish and I wanna help people with longstanding diabetes like myself, um, where we say, okay, we, we know that uh, our beta cells are unfortunately gone. Is there anything that we can do to help control our blood sugars and help reduce all the other metabolic issues that come around with, with type 1 diabetes. So not talking about artificial pancreas, but are there, are there medications in addition to insulin that I can take to help me get better results? And keeping in mind, we always will need insulin, so I'm not ever saying that we would use this instead of insulin, but in addition to insulin, just like all of our friends in the type 2 field have been doing for a long time. I'm so jealous of these type 2s that get to pick between like 10 different medications uh, to help you know, improve different metabolic things. And with type 1 diabetes, it's just like, oh, just take insulin, what's the big deal? Like you don't have beta cells, take insulin. Uh, but there's other things that are, that are a problem. So first of all, how are we doing with just insulin? If we ask what's going on in the country in terms of our outcomes, to be honest, it's, it's not good. It's not great at all. So our average A1C in the country is about 8.3%. Another way of saying this is that only about 20% of adults get their A1C less than 7. So it's the vast majority of you probably listening out there that you're not quite where you want to be in terms of your blood sugar control. And a huge part of that is that it's not your fault. Insulin has its issues. We have to inject it subcutaneously. It takes forever to get absorbed. Um, you know, it's the roller coaster of type 1 diabetes. So can't we give people other options in addition to insulin to help improve this number, uh, which, which kind of sucks. What about this? Two out of three patients with type 1 diabetes are either overweight or obese. So we talk about that with type 2s all the time. Of course, you know, weight and obesity is a huge problem in type 2 diabetes. But guess, uh, guess what? Us type 1s, we can gain weight too. We can eat just like anybody else. And I think it's actually easier for type 1s to gain weight um, because you're taking insulin, you can get low, you have to eat at times you don't want to eat, it can make exercise difficult, etc. So when we think about type 1s, I think the stereotype is these thin little four-year-olds running around having a good time. But a lot of us, we grow up and we can gain weight. So this is a problem that we need to address for type 1 diabetes. What about diabetic ketoacidosis? That's probably what you went into when you were first diagnosed. This is still the number one cause of death in kids with type 1 diabetes. So this isn't, unfortunately, this is, this is still common and still happening and people are still dying of DKA um, in 2021. And uh, I'm gonna get to the good news, but right now I'm just laying out the bad stuff. So what about risk of heart disease? Well, us type 1s, we have an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, two to four fold increase from, from, from non-diabetics. And even in type 1s that control their blood sugars, we still have this increased risk of heart disease. So there's probably something going, else going on that is independent of your blood glucose control, which leads me to the last one, that us type 1s, we actually have insulin resistance. That because we inject our insulin into the fat and you know, into basically the fat tissue, um, it takes large amounts of insulin, um, much larger than you would need if it was coming from your pancreas. So any type one out there is probably taking twice as much insulin as they would normally take from their pancreas. And those large amounts of insulin can make you resistant to insulin and may actually lead to cardiovascular disease. So potentially some therapies that can help us lower how much insulin we take might be helpful. And this is where we come in in our, in our field of research is we wanna develop therapies or bring them to market that improve blood sugar, can help potentially with weight, DKA, increased risk of heart disease, insulin resistance, et cetera. So it's a tall order, but it's definitely doable. All this stuff is happening in type two diabetes, so why can't us type ones do it? So the specific example I wanna give you is we've been working with a lot with a medication that blocks the hormone glucagon, blocks the action of glucagon. So you guys hopefully know what, what glucagon is. It's kind of the yin to insulin's yang where um, insulin brings your blood sugars down, glucagon brings your blood sugars up. So what's the problem? Well, let me bring you over to this chart over here. So what's the problem with glucagon? Well, glucagon is secreted by something called the alpha cell, which is right next to the beta cell in the, in the pancreas. 
And when the beta cells get you know, destroyed, the alpha cells basically don't know what to do. And they secrete glucagon in a real haphazard manner. So as I mentioned, glucagon normally increases your, 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 your blood sugar. So when normal or, or non-diabetic people eat, um, let's say we give them a meal right here, their levels of glucagon actually go down typically after they eat a meal. That makes sense. When you're eating something that has sugar or calories in it, you don't need a hormone to raise your blood sugar. So the body kind of decreases glucagon and normally increases insulin. And with people with type 1 diabetes, that's completely um, flipped on its head. That if you give people with type 1 diabetes a meal, even with insulin, that their glucagon levels actually go up. And this increase in glucagon actually makes your liver put out more glucose. So this is another reason why it's really hard to fight that spike after eating, because our insulin is, is delayed with its absorption, you're secreting too much glucagon, there's a lot of things that you're fighting against. So there's an opportunity here though to correct this, this defect with something we call a glucagon receptor antagonist, or a GRA. And we've been studying a, a particular compound that's a once a week injection in people with type 1 diabetes. We just finished a large study in 150 type 1s uh, where we treated them with this drug for about three months and found that this once a week injection was able to lower people's A1C by about 0.6%, which for a type 1 drug is actually huge. You know, so taking you from 7.6 to 7, you know, et cetera. So, you know, not a, a you know, a 2% reduction, but still very meaningful and was able to get a better A1C and, and had people use less insulin, about 15% insulin and 15% less. Which going back to my previous point about insulin resistance, I think lowering the amount of insulin that we take will be very helpful in terms of improving our insulin sensitivity and potentially reducing cardiovascular risk. And the last little thing that's, that's interesting about glucagon is that when glucagon levels are high, it actually promotes ketone formation, the thing that causes DKA. So we actually found with this drug that you can actually decrease the amount of ketones people produce, so potentially even protect them a little bit from diabetic ketoacidosis. So this particular compound, this approach is going into larger studies starting hopefully this year and could be on a path to approval in the next couple years. And I'm just using this to, to highlight the type of research that we do, that there's stuff going on that can help you guys living with type 1 diabetes in terms of getting better outcomes. And I'm glad we're starting to really explore non-insulin therapies like we do in type 2s.